Good evening, and welcome to What's Your Story? I'm your host, James Ransom Reed, Jr. Have we got a story for you tonight? Wow. Have you ever heard of the phrase, the sport of kings? You're going to know what that's all about tonight, and you're going to meet a very, very special woman who has played an instrumental role in uh, the equestrian arts. I am so very pleased to have as my guest tonight the president and CEO of the Ebony Horse Women, Mrs. Patricia E. Kelly. Welcome to the program, Thank Ms. You, Kelly. Thank you, Jim. Thank you, Jim. Very happy to be here. Man, I, I've been looking, I've been trying to get you for over a year. <laughs> that <you know>. long. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. I called the office several times, but uh, what people don't really know that you and I were talking about is the role of African Americans mm -hmm. in the, uh, the the sport of kings. Correct. And we're going to talk about all of that tonight. But let's get started. Would you please share with our audience a little information like about where you were born? Tell us mm -hmm. about that. Well, uh, you know, I'm <laughs> born and bred right here in Connecticut, but in Hartford, Connecticut. Um, parents that came from the South uh, in the early 20s. We're about to the South. Uh, one from Alabama. Bama. Uh, yep, and one from Georgia via Florida. So um, my mother's parents were Seminoles. And so um, they migrated, some migrated from Florida to Georgia and then eventually came to Connecticut. Wow. Yeah. Have you been to either of those states where your parents oh, were born? absolutely. <laughs> absolutely. I mean, that was our punishment for the summer. <laughs> you know, we go... The long go, ride in that hot car? to grandma's house in the summer. In that know? hot car, right? Oh, my God, Oh, yes. my goodness gracious, yeah. yeah. You have any memories of that, fond memories down with grandma? I don't know about fond memories. I just remember um, being told about what snakes look like and, you know, their trails that they make and, and um, chickens that chased us around the yard and... Um, when they turned off the lights, it was like God had turned off the lights to the world. It was the darkest dark I'd ever seen. I in had my that life. experience had that down experience. there too. Yes, I did. Oh my God! And smoke houses and and um, just assortment of all kinds of animals. It was a real country life, you know. Everybody made their own preserves and had their own um, meat houses. It was it was just I don't know. The kids didn't seem to be very energetic you know they were just different than city kids and when we went down there we were like uh, ducks out of water like what is this place this is alien to us where did you go to school uh well of course being in Hartford, i went to um northeast junior high school before that it was arsenal annex and then um Northeast Junior High School, and I graduated from Weaver High School in Hartford. So you're a Weaver Beaver. I certainly am. All right. Do you have you have you gone back for any of the class reunions? Uh, yes, I have. Um, it's now a little, um, I should say, depressing because some of my classmates are no longer with us. Yes. You know? Yes. But um, I try to go every time we have a reunion because it's good to see everybody from way back in the day. Yeah. And see what they're doing and how they're doing. Did you go to your senior prom? Oh. Absolutely. You're, tell me, tell us about that. Oh God! That's how oh. we connect with the audience. A lot of people like oh, that. Oh yeah. my God! I had, I fought with my mother to buy this this gown. It was a pink gown. It was horrible. We were going downtown, <laughs> uh, city of Harper downtown, and I finally got her to agree to, for me to buy this pink gown, and I was all set and ready to go. Uh, and the, let me interrupt here. Mm -hmm. You went downtown. What store was down there? Oh Sage Allen? Um, Fox? D. Fox? No. Grant? No, no. It wasn't. It was Brown Thompson. Okay, yes. I was at Brown Thompson. Okay. We that'll, it was, that'll ring a bell with a lot of people. Yeah, it was quite a battle. Quite a battle. Um, I wanted something a little bit more you know, off the shoulder and whatnot. And she <laughs> Mom was wasn't like, having any of it. You're going to be up to here, you know. <laughs> and and the, the night of the, the prom, um, one of the guys had a car. He borrowed the car from his dad. And, wow. and my date and I were in the car, and we went to um, the the prom. It was really nice. It was Weaver High School. Um, our dean was, um, oh, my God, I'm just forgetting her name. That's okay. It'll come Anyway, to you. but it was, you know, everybody was there. Everybody was dressed up. And then we went to um, a uh, dinner afterwards. And I was so embarrassed to eat in front of my, my guests. I was so hungry. 
<laughs> but so embarrassed to eat because it was just new for me, you know, because back then, you know, you didn't date like kids date today. You yep, know, at, yep. They start dating at 10 years old. <laughs> you had to be about 30 before your parents would let you have a boyfriend. So I was so embarrassed, but I got yes. through the night and it, it was really nice. It was really, really nice. Good, good. You have siblings? I do, I do. I have um, a deceased brother, mm -hmm. but another brother, uh, two other brothers, one in Massachusetts, one in Connecticut, and I have a sister that is deceased as okay. well. Are your brothers writers or anybody else in your family right? Yeah. No. Um, no one but me. My father, of course, was, was the initiator, um, if you will, of all this, but no, the other kids didn't write at all. No. Wow. Mm -mm. Tell us about your parents, because that's kind of where we get to oh, know the person. They were, Tell us about um, mom and dad. Start with mom. What was mom like? Well, she probably was the smartest woman that I have ever met in my life. Smartest um, in terms of she economics? She was extremely uh, intelligent. Okay. She, she could read a book in a day. Wow. Um, she, she had an unfortunate childhood in that her mom died when she was eight years old, and then the father died 11 months later. And um, the two oldest sisters then took over the parenting of the siblings in yes. the family. Yes. Um, one of the sisters did go back to the Seminoles uh, and took some of the children with them there. And then um, my mom's uh, oldest sister took her and some other siblings and came to Hartford. Um, they did try to reunite, reunite the kids in Florida. What was your mom's name? Her name was Anne. Her, well, that wasn't her native name. Um, her, her name was Gal, Annie Gal. And she was just a beautiful lady. So very strong, very intelligent, um, but wasn't able to accomplish her dreams because of the death. Now we're talking, my mom was born in 1908. Mm -hmm. um, and so she, when parents died, um, a lot of things fell apart. She wasn't able to accomplish the things that she had hoped for. Although she was quite capable of doing any and everything that she wanted to do because she was just that intelligent. Um, my dad was born in 1899. His parents were slaves. And dad uh, lived on the plantation after the emancipation with his family sharecropping. Who was your dad's name? John. John. As a matter of fact, he was named after the plantation owner. And uh, they stayed there. Um, dad's mom was part white. She was half white. And the father was full African. So, and dad came out with a coloring that he could pass as white mm -hmm. if necessary. And which in some cases worked to his stead, um, being in the South at that time, because he was fair of color. Mm. Um, but again, the conditions of racism in the South drove him out of the, the South to Connecticut. Mm -hmm. So they were strong. My father was a master carpenter. Um, he could build anything. As a matter of fact, he could fix anything. But his trade was carpentry, and he was a master at it. And he worked um, his entire life um, as his own um, entrepreneur. He, he, didn't, never, he never worked for anybody. He always worked for himself. And I just remember that the day he died, uh, people were still calling him to fix things for them. So my dad um, taught us the, the, well, he didn't teach us. We had the spirit of entrepreneurship. Mm -hmm. But he did, he did give us the rudiments of it, you know, you know, that it was a difficult position, but it was a position to, to warrant and to have. Uh, Mom cleaned houses. Again, we're talking about the early 20s for a black woman mm -hmm. in, in Connecticut without yeah all of the formal education, so she, she cleaned houses. But in, the, that, in and of that, she was an entrepreneur. Mm -hmm. She wrote her own you know, um, times, her days that she worked, her hours that she worked, and what she would work for. So I had two entrepreneurs in the family who stressed um, not being an employee, but being an employer. And, and I think all of the kids got that, that kind of training from those two. What impact do your parents have on you? Tremendous, tremendous. Um, 
they were two different kind of people. Even though they both were uh, entrepreneurs, yes. Um, Dad was pretty much a man of few words. You know, carried a big stick, but few words. Uh, Mom was very, very vocal. Um, she was more of the disciplinarian, and the strength, the the, the fortitude that I saw in them growing up um, had a great impact on my life. My father was. Um, he bought our first house through a Jewish oxy. And Explain what that is. Well, it was like a credit union in the Jewish community way back in the day. Yeah. And because he was, again, so fair of color um, and did a lot of work in the Jewish community, he was privy to this this fund of monies. And from the oxy, he was able to purchase our home, our first home. Um, he purchased many homes after that, but our first home he purchased from the oxy. And so um, dad was, oh God, I, I guess <laughs> one of the ways to, to describe him fiscally was that he was stingy. Mm -hmm. He was very stingy, but he was very, very big on saving money, accumulating, and investing. My father had stocks and bonds when most black people in the 20s didn't know what stocks and bonds were. Mm -hmm. So we came up with that kind of financial kind of information as well and, and, and not spending money. Um, I remember when I was a young woman married, I bought an electric can opener. And, <laughs> and this man had a fit. Your dad did? Oh my God. He yeah. was like, what was wrong with the hand crank? Why are you spending your money up on these gadgets? Why yeah, are you doing yeah, that? Yeah. But I'm like, Dad, it's, everybody has an electric can opener and that's why you need to have one? How much did you spend for that? And he was just terrible with that. But if we went off on vacation, you know, he would open up the wallet and, mm -hmm. and we could get what we want. But so it, it taught us how to manage money. He taught us what money was. It wasn't for, you know, most people's thoughts were to just buy things. You know, they were, money was for protection. Money was for um, making sure that you had everything that you need and some of what you wanted. Mm -hmm. So he was very, very um, strict on that. Mom was a little bit more liberal, but she understood him. So they were, they were like a, a, a real good team. They had tremendous impact on all of us. Uh, education was big in the house. Um, going to church. <laughs> church was a part of that? Daddy was a deacon in the church. Oh, yeah. Um, he went to church, every, and we had to go to Sunday school. I think we were in every club in the church. We were in the BTU. We were in the usher board. We were in the choir. We were in Sunday school. We yes. were in all of that. And it was... Um, it was an education. It was now an, another education about about um, religion. But Daddy hated preachers, which I couldn't understand. He he would say preachers were not t teaching from the Bible, you know. So after church, we would go over to his brother's house, mm -hmm. and he would tear down the sermon, and he'd br break open the Bible and say, "He said this," and. And this is what the Bible says. And he said that. And, but this is what the Bible said. So what he said was wrong. Do you understand what I'm saying? And then he said this. And this is what the Bible says. And it was just grueling. <laughs> but again, he taught us to be um, investigative. He taught inquisitive. us inquisitive. Not inquisitive, not to take everything at face value. Absolutely. Um, yep. His favorite phrase was study to show thyself approved, a workman that need not error, rightly dividing the word of truth. Wow. And that stuck to us like you would not believe. And so we, we grew up with, you know, not hearing things and taking it for face value without investigating it. So it they had a tremendous impact on us. Wow. You mentioned that your family or your mother was Seminole? Yeah, my mother was, my mother's, my grandmother was full Seminole, my mother's part Seminole. Tell our audience what you know about the Seminoles. Who are they? Well, I can start with they never made a treaty with the United States. <laughs> Um, and because the, the chief at the time never believed in the truthfulness of a treaty with the U.S. Um, they migrated um, from other parts of the country to Florida, to the Florida Ed Everglades, which pretty much protected them from being um, um, warred against. Not many would go, want to go into the Everglades. Mm -hmm. Very mm -hmm. proud people, mm -hmm. uh, very traditional 
people who who understood a woman's rights. So you would think that in a native tribe, women would take the back seat. Not no, not not necessarily. Not in the Seminole tribe. They not that they had equal standings with the men, but they were very much respected mm -hmm. for for what they brought to the tribe and to the family. So it was it was um, another part of our education to know that side of our uh, lineage. Wow, that sounds fascinating. I could, wow. Well, well, it was. Um, but again, it was a little difficult because sure. um, some of us could not live with them because some of us were of a darker hue. Sure. So we weren't able to stay, which is why one sister did come back to Connecticut and stayed with a, a, a group of the siblings. Even then, huh? Even then. Wow. You know, I noticed that you brought a saddle. Yeah. And uh, I think our viewing audience at home could see that. Now, would you please tell us what that is and uh, <laughs> yes. how it works without getting out of your seat? What is that? Yeah, well, it's an English saddle. It's an all-purpose English saddle. Um, it has um, it, it, the English saddle as opposed to a Western saddle is a saddle that brings you a little bit more closer to the horse so that you can feel the movement of the horse under you and better to navigate. It is, um, it is not a saddle that I would use for hunter jumpers, um, but, but for pleasure riding, I would certainly use it. These saddles have to be fitted to the horse. It's not that you can buy a saddle and just put it on a horse and, and go off. The saddle has to fit, the, the pommel area has to be, has to clear the withers of the horse. You want to make sure that the tree underneath is not pressing against the shoulder. So it's a saddle that is made specifically for a particular horse and a particular rider. The, set, the seat is measured to, to fit the rider. Um, and so, and everything else is there to fit the, um, the horse so the horse can have full movement, body movement under him. You know, <laughs> I've watched my share of cowboy movies growing yeah. up. That ain't it. <laughs> no, that's not it. No. <laughs> now, that saddle has what you call the... Uh... So the Western saddle has a lot more leather. Okay. It's like sitting in a rocking chair. I love them. Okay. The seat is much broader. Okay. Um, there is a horn where you can tie your ropes and other things, lead lines, other things that you might need to carry with you. Um, it has a skirt under it, a bigger skirt underneath mm -hmm. it. You could throw a saddle bag on the back. Mm -hmm. It's a working cowboy saddle, but that is the English saddle. That is something where you are now wanting to be closer to the horse to be able to feel um, the movements on the horse and be able to guide the horse with different cues. But a Western saddle is a working saddle. Now, a Western saddle doesn't have to be fitted to the horse, does it? Yes, it does. Oh, it does? It does, because if you put it on, let's say you have a quarter horse. Oh, you know? yeah. Okay. Quarter horses are broad in the chest and broad in the behind. Okay. And so you got to have a, a tree that will clear, clear, not only the gullet should clear the withers so that the gullet is not sitting on top of the withers, which can cause a back injury. Okay. And that the tree is wide enough to get the broadness of the, the horse without pinching. Oh. On the back. And then, of course, you have to look at how far it extends down the back of the horse to make sure it's not hitting uh, sore spots uh, that, could, that could cause sore spots Oof. on the horse. So, yes, all these saddles have to be fitted. Well, I, I know you learned something out there, didn't you? <laughs> I, yes, you did. I can tell. You're smiling. Yeah. The, um, hmm. I got to be honest, and I have to say, y you are the first uh, person of color that I've met who actually rides a road, mm -hmm. who actually has a knowledge and a history of the equestrian sport mm -hmm. and the involvement of people of color in it. So let's start by saying, where did you develop your love for horses? You know, Jim, um, I think it's in my genes um, because my dad was a jockey when he was a young boy. And they never talked about it. So I, I never grew up with history about horses or all of that. I, I think it just was in my genes and it began to break out um, <laughs> at, a, at a point in my life where they couldn't hold it back any further. This love um, came at a time when, when I think I needed it. So we bought a house in Hartford. And it was in an all-Jewish neighborhood. Actually, it was Jewish and Italian neighborhood. Mm -hmm. And we bought, my dad bought this house from a woman who was a Holocaust survivor named Betsy Kaplan. 
and she hated prejudice. And uh, the neighbors were not very happy that she had sold my family this house. And on a particular day, they had gotten up a petition um, to employ Miss Miss Kaplan to come and explain why she did this. And on that particular day, I was home. It was in the summer, and I was peeking from around the side of the house, um, listening to this commotion out in front. And I was thinking to myself, oh my God, I sure wish my mom doesn't come outside because I didn't want that native blood to get enacted. Yeah. So um, in back of me, I hear this beckoning, this pss, and I turned around, and there was this, this white guy with a big white beard and a big stomach and rosy cheeks. And the first thing I said to myself was, my God, I live next door to Santa Claus. <laughs> and this gentleman said to me, little girl, you don't need to hear that. Come here. And there was this raggedy fence that separated our property, mm -hmm. and he was standing next to this horse. Mm -hmm. And he said, little girl, do you like the horse? And I nodded yes. He said, come. And I crawled through a broken piece of the fence, and Mr. Fisher handed me a brush, and it was a wrap. I was Mr. Fisher's saddle, uh, his, his shadow from that day on. Mr. Fisher taught me how to groom a horse, how to tack a horse, how to ride a horse. And I think that he unlocked the doors to that stuff that was in my genes about horses. It was Mr. Fisher. You know, it's kind of ironic that we're talking about people, uh, Jewish people, mm -hmm. not wanting you, uh, your family to buy in their neighborhood largely. Mm -hmm. um, and we see the anti-Semitism in the news today. Yeah. So I guess it never goes away, does it? it just... Well, you know, people are going to be people, and they, they have their um, ideas about other people. But Mr. Fisher didn't. He didn't. Miss Kaplan didn't. OK. And Mr. Fisher didn't. And he didn't care what anybody said. Mr. Fisher and I were buddies. There we go. <laughs> we were buddies um, until that horse died. The horse never had a name. He called the horse horse. Yeah. So, okay, it was just a horse. And every day after school, um, I would be with Mr. Fisher. Mr. Fisher used to deliver produce. Oh, my God, I'm dating myself. That's all right. I remember that. He used that. to uh, um, develop, um, deliver produce through the community on a horse and wagon. I remember that. You, Oh, God, do you? I do, Oh, yes. boy, we are so old. Watermelon, they used to oh, have some. God, oh, God, God, we're so old. Oh, yeah. And oh, I yeah. would wait, you know, if, if he was out while I was at school, I would just sit and wait until he got back. Wait you for know, Mr. Fisher. Wait for Mr. Fisher, and that was my life. Wow. Would you share with us uh, your knowledge of the different types of horses? Oh, God, there's so many. Um, your favorite. Start with your favorite. American Quarter Horse. American. What's a they, quarter horse? What well, does that mean? It's, it's a horse that was bred um, from... So Spain invaded um, the, the, the Americas and, and lost the revolution and left horses on the prairie. Ah, okay? okay. And so those horses were picked up by Native Americans. And out of these breedings, the Mustang came mm -hmm. and other mm -hmm. breeds came after that as well, coming mm -hmm. from that initial strain of horses. Mm -hmm. The American Quarter Horse is called the Quarter Horse because it's the fastest at the quarter mile. Ah. It doesn't have the lung capacity to do the kind of races that, that thoroughbred stuff okay. do. But they're big and strong and they have good minds on them okay. and they're calm they're they're more um, warm-blooded because okay. they have their calmness to them right. and they'll work for you they will bust their hearts to work for you right. um, they're just beautiful horses and they're good working horses I just love them good that's all the time we have for part one of this interview with mrs. Patricia Kelly president and CEO of the ebony horse women please stay tuned for part two Everybody has a story. What's yours? I'm your host, James Ransom Reed, Jr. Until next time, good evening.
The Saybrook Fish House in Canton has been serving fresh seafood, chicken, and steak entrees for 34 years, offering three cozy dining room settings, a newly renovated pub with craft beer, wine by the glass, specialty cocktails, and a lighter fare menu. Open for lunch and dinner seven days a week. Reservations accepted for parties of 2 to 42, and gift certificates are also available. The Saybrook Fish House, nestled at the crossroads of Route 44, 202, and 179 in Canton.